Hello, this is Uho and I'm Brad Warner Hi. in Osaka. Yeah. You're visiting Japan for the first time in 14 years, I think. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly when. I, it was at least 2009 or 2010 when I last came to Japan. Has Japan changed a lot? You know, not as much as I, I thought. Uh, I mean, there was all the lockdowns and things, and that changed stuff. And then some of the record stores I like went out of business, so that's a little sad for me because I'm a big record collector. But, uh, but otherwise, it seems like the same, yeah. Were you ever into Japanese bands? Some, but I was never. I didn't. I didn't know the the, the scene that well. There was, I see. there was a couple, and they, the Japanese bands I liked, like even Japanese people don't know. I see. There was a band called Ariki Buran, and I really loved that band. <laughs> uh, and then I looked. I, I I look on the internet and stuff, and even searching in Japanese, nobody says anything about Ariki Buran, and they were my favorite band. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. How about the boredoms? I know them, but uh, uh, yeah, but I haven't really followed their career or anything. I see. Well, there's another band, um, what the hell are they called? Uh, uh, oh shit. Oh, there's this psychedelic band that's been around forever that's really good. The ex it turns out they're more Acid Mother's Temple. Acid Mother's Temple. And it turns out they're more popular in America than Japan. There's some bands like Shon and Knife, nobody knows yeah. them in, in, yeah. in uh, like they're from Osaka, but nobody in Osaka knows Shon and Knife. Yeah, and yeah. They were big in the 80s and 90s. That's true, yeah. America. I once wrote to Shon and Knife and I got a nice postcard back from their <laughs> drummer. And I still have it somewhere. When I first got to Japan, I wrote to her like a letter, fan letter. <laughs> I wrote Shon and Knife, I didn't really write to one single person there. Oh. And then the drummer wrote back to me, it was really nice. <laughs> One thing that I would like to talk about with you is Zen in the West. Okay. Um, okay. Like, you trained in Japan with your teacher Nishijima Roshi, but now you're teaching in the West. So you know how Zen is yeah, practiced bit, yeah. in Japan and how it's practiced and taught in the West. Do you see differences? Well, yeah, I mean, there's that... that Thing that we were talking about earlier where the Japanese like if you're if you go to a Japanese Zen temple they give you very little instruction mm -hmm. you know, that tends to be the case even my even my teacher who was very used to dealing with Westerners hardly gave he gave a little bit more instruction than the average Japanese teacher but it was mostly just the mechanics like you're gonna sit here in the position and, and what you're gonna you know how you're gonna sit and what time you're gonna be there and that kind of thing and then after that it was just like mm. You're on your own. You have to figure out yes. what, what to do with this 40 minutes now that you're going to do this. You know, what, what am I supposed to be doing for 40 minutes? Well, you're sitting there. Well, you know, and then people want more. Yes. You know, and, and, and that, tends to be, that tends to be an issue when I, uh, when I go and, and give these uh, retreats and things in Europe and in America where people want like a detailed instructions mm. about mm. what am I supposed to do mm. when, I, when I do this. Uh, that I think is a, is a big difference. But also the thing you probably noticed is like, it, it seems to be easier to find people who are serious about Zen practice in the US and Europe than it does in Japan. Like you don't, like almost everybody, I mean Zen is a very popular sort of religion here, you know, Zen, And, and so you meet people, I've knew people at work who were like, oh yeah, I'm Sotoshu, Zen yeah, Sotoshu. Yeah. They knew that they, that's what their family temple was. They'd never done Zazen mm. at all. They mm. were amazed, you know, I'd be like, I'm going off to a retreat and I'm going to do this for the weekend or you know, whatever it was. And they were just amazed that somebody would do that. So that's, in a way, it feels like the transfer is happening, like the... Um, Like Buddhism went from India and then up into China and then down through Korea and in Japan, and now it's it's going to uh, America and Europe, and that's where more serious practice, I think, is being done in America and Europe than in Japan, and certainly more than in China, you know, where it's been legal. For, you know, I, don't, I guess it's, I guess it's legal to practice now there. I don't really know, but. Um, yeah, so, so you, you find more people who are serious. So sometimes people will come to me and say, you know, they, I'm serious about Zazen for Zen practice and I want to go to Japan and I, I tell them you, you're actually probably better off where you are. 
you know, in America or mm. Germany mm. or wherever I happen to have this conversation, Finland, I go mm. to Finland a lot, you know, you probably, I mean, even that would sound like an obscure example, but I, I would think even in Finland, you would have more of a, an opportunity to, to really do a serious Zen practice in Finland mm. than mm. in Japan. Mm. Um, so that's that's a big difference. I think. Mm. I think lots of Westerners, when they come to Japan, have the feeling that uh, us, at least some, maybe many of the practitioners here, just go through the movements. Yeah. Especially if they're only in it because they've been born as the first son in the temple. Sure. Uh, for them, uh, zazen just means to sit still and well doze off. Yeah. yeah. And um, so in that way, I think. It's maybe a good thing that we in the West ask, well, how is it done? Why do we do it? What's the meaning of yeah, that? Yeah. Well, uh, ask for, well, the meaning of things. Why do we do that? Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, uh, there's maybe the tendency to, well, over-intellectualize it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how you feel about, well, I've... I visited the US, but it's long ago, so most of my experience is with German groups. Mm -hmm. um, when I visited Germany and Switzerland last year, there was a lot of talk about, uh, well, what's happening to Zen in the West? Like 40 years ago, when both of us started in mm -hmm. the 80s, it almost seemed that um, Zen is the future in the West, or yeah. the West is the future for Zen, and everybody, well, said it's already dead in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, when you visit Europe, when I was in my 20s, there were other people in their 20s, there were mm -hmm. lots of young people. When I go now, <laughs> those uh, the, the same twin, people. The, exactly. <laughs> and where, where are the people in the 20s? Yeah, some of yeah, them yeah. maybe do Tibetan Buddhism, some of them do, do Theravada, some of them do completely different things. So a lot of people ask themselves, at least when I visited last year, where are the young people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is Zen dying already after 40 or 50 years? And I had the impression that maybe a part of the reason is that this over-intellectualization or this talk that went in the 80s, uh, like Japanese Buddhism is only form, it's only ritual. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need the ropes, we don't need the bowls, and you come from a tradition yeah, where yeah, yeah. form is not valued so much. And I can see that point because you get attached to the form. Yeah. So what is important? For some, it's the enlightenment experience. For others, it's uh, practicing in daily life. Mm -hmm. And but what I felt is missing in a lot of these centers. For example, everybody's talking about that everyday life is there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, when you look, uh, who's washing the dishes? Well, somebody's washing the dishes. Yeah, yeah. Somebody drops uh, a cup of to to uh, coffee. Um, they ask, "What sh shall I do?" Oh, just leave it like that. Somebody's going to clean yeah, up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Let's who's going <laughs> to clean up? <laughs> Somebody's going to clean up. Yeah. Um, I had the feeling that these a lot of these sessions also they, they, it's also like a, it's almost like a seminary. And yeah. of course, it's not the form, but I have the feeling that something is missing or something might get got lost. It could be, yeah. I mean, I, I you, like you said about the forms, like Nishijima Roshi was not really into. He wore the robes and shaved his head, but he never thought. He said, "If you want to, it's." Yeah, he would say, "It's just my habit." Yeah, you know, he yeah. never made a big deal out of it. If you want to do that, you can do that. If you don't want to do, it. and his his uh, the ceremonies, even when we went to sashins, were very. I mean, compared to how a re regular Japanese sashin is, you know, usually there's the ceremonies and, and rituals were very little. You know, he didn't even do like a chanting service in the mornings, you know, which is kind of a common thing. Um, so, uh, so it was very minimal. I'm not sure where I was going with that. Um, but he was all about sitting, and so I tried to do that. Okay, yeah, that's where I was going with it. When I got back to America, I found people were too, a little bit too mm. attracted by that idea of like, oh, let's just get rid of the ritual. So yes, I started, yes, yes. I actually went and learned, I went to, up to Tassajara and learned a bunch of the rituals which Nishijima Roshi had never bothered to teach and started bringing those back because I thought, oh, you guys need this because 
you know, you're, you're, it's much too easy for you to say, oh, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't need those rituals, you know, I'm like, well, maybe, maybe it'd be good to challenge yourself with, with some of that. So I started to bring it, I brought it back, even though that my teacher was kind of against it. Mm. You know, and I feel like I'm, am I betraying Nishima's spirit, you know, by, by introducing all this stuff that he never taught. Um, and because he never taught it, I feel like I don't know it very well. You know, I just picked it up from watching these guys in Tassajara do it, and I had one guy who, who actually showed me you know, how to do it. But it's kind of ironic that I spent 11 years in Japan, you know, with most of it with this Japanese Zen teacher, and I never learned how to do... He would, the, the robe chant was very important to him. Yeah. Uh, the meal chant was very important to him. Mm. After that, mm. he didn't care. Even chanting Heart Sutra, he didn't do that. Oh, that's you know, that's basic stuff. But there is this other aspect, and I, I mm. kind of in America, yes. if you talk about Zen in the West, Americans really have that tendency to commercialize mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is. They'll mm. they'll find an angle to, to to commercialize it, and that's the thing that bothers me more than anything about Zen in America is that it's commercialized. It's also kind of fossilized in a way and and politicized you know they get into the what know, do you mean by fossilized well they just kind of yeah I don't know where I'm going with that it's just it, it's like they they kind of um, they kind of have tried to set up the thing and that this is um, how you it's done. It like yeah, that. yeah which I think is, uh, is good in a way yeah, we are running out of time, which is sad, because yeah. I would have loved to talk about the politicization as yeah, well. Yeah, but sure. I don't see that much in Europe. I don't know if I'm just missing it because I'm... Mm, maybe it's not, not as strong. The language, but, yeah. but it's also there. But unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> and you talked about it on your channel. So yeah, if yeah. anybody's listening to that now and you want Brad's take on politics and Zen, go to his channel. Yeah. <laughs> The camera is gonna switch off any second. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Brad, for the yeah. talk. Yeah, thank you. Have a good time in yeah. Japan. <laughs> yeah, that's a 